I think we're going to have to revise that note when you introduce me as an international criminal and then go on. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it international human rights and criminal law. It's a great uh, pleasure to, to be here uh, back in uh, Yerevan. I visited Armenia uh, many times. Always uh, to talk about the past, um, about the genocide uh, and the aftermath of the genocide and about justice for genocide in Armenia and in other uh, parts of the world as well. Uh, and this time it's to talk not just about the past, which is relevant to transitional justice, but also about the future. Because I think this is probably where transitional justice sets itself uh, apart, or at least it, um, underscores its uniqueness, is that it is about dealing with a past that is behind you, you've drawn a line, and about moving forward. So it involves compromises, complex compromises and decisions. I come at it, as, as you do, Sarah, we come, as lawyers, we look for rigid, we like legal rules and policies that we can apply in a, in a strict manner. And we're uncomfortable, actually, when a degree of discretion enters the calculation. But this is a subject that is all about discretionary choices, because it's about balancing different interests, a need for justice, for accountability, respect for the victims and their entitlement to see that justice is done, but also uh, broader concerns about building something new and about changing the future of a country. It's a great privilege to be here at this uh, fantastic moment in the history of, uh, of your country. I'm so grateful to be a part of it and even to make a, a minor uh, contribution to the discussions and to the past that, that you choose. I should say no one's mentioned it yet, but I would be remiss if I didn't also just say one word of sympathy about the loss of the great troubadour who is being buried today, I guess, in, in Paris. And we all mourn. Transitional justice is a notion, it's a concept, it's an expression that is about 25 years old. I think there are two American or American US based scholars who quarrel a little bit about who invented the term. When I say quarrel, they're friends and they each say the other invented the term. Uh, Ruti Titel, you'll know she has a book on, on transitional justice, and Neil Cripps, who did a three volume collection, both of them started using the term at some point around 92 or 93. Uh, so almost exactly a quarter of a century we've been talking about it. It's good for Armenia because you've got 25 years now of experience and practice and reflection on what this process is all about to inform what you do and to develop really what should be a unique, innovative, who knows, 25 years from now, people will talk about the Armenian path or the Armenian approach. It's an opportunity to be creative, but drawing on the lessons of all of the other uh, um, experiences with transitional justice. In the early 90s, we were talking about three different types of transitional <coughs> problems. Um, the first one, which is maybe the one that's, that's closest to, to the situation here, was associated with the breakup of the Soviet Union and the needs of countries, mainly in Central and Eastern Europe, to deal with the crimes and problems of the past. So they had to deal, uh, to take on, for example, in Germany, the issues of the killings of people trying to uh, cross over into West Berlin or to West Germany and the killings by the border guard. So hard core criminal law violations, killings, arbitrary killing of people. And so that was one of one part of the issue. Uh, but there were also issues that are also very important um, concerning, for example, the vetting, or what's called sometimes lustration. It's, it's not a term that's so commonly, not everybody who is fluent in English even knows the term lustration. But vetting is well understood. I think the UN has opted now for vetting rather than lustration. This is the idea that you purge your existing um, system 
of the people who were responsible for the abuses of the past. And that's a complicated process. My colleagues, I think, will say more about that. It's probably something of concern to a lot of people in this country who are wondering where the, where the line will be drawn. Um, it, it's worth recalling, I think it's worth mentioning that it takes place in a context that wouldn't have existed 25 years ago and before that, because all of this is taking place within the framework of the European Convention of Human Rights and the uh, possible intervention of the European Court of Human Rights. So of course you have a great constitution, but you also have that level of international supervision that should reassure people who are nervous that their rights may be violated in the course of this process. So that's the, that, that was one of the parts of transitional justice in the early days. The second um, kind of laboratory, in a way, for transitional justice was the, the former the dictatorships in Latin America, particularly in what's called the Southern Cone, Argentina, Chile, um, Uruguay, um, to some extent Brazil. These were countries where you had had very brutal dictatorships and where there were thousands of deaths attributed to them, high, high level of extraordinarily brutal uh, repression and military governments. And so you had dysfunctional regimes and there were transitions that also involved to a certain extent the recognition by the people in power that they had to hand over the reins of power. And so it also involved a degree of compromises with them to get them to let go. That generated special issues in that part of the world, in particular about amnesties, whether or not you could give amnesties. Amnesties were a common feature there where they said, we'll draw a line with the past, we'll move on, just get out of the way, and we'll, we'll forget about the past. And, and so that was a problem, and that was something that those countries have returned to again and again and are still doing. They're still revisiting the events uh, of the 1970s and the 1980s. There are, of course, many survivors, families, people who are still, for whom those uh, terrible uh, acts of the late 1970s are, are still quite fresh. And so it's an ongoing process. And I think this is a, also a very useful point to bear in mind. Transitional justice, you'll still be doing it 25 years from now. It's just the beginning. You know, it's not even the end of the beginning, as Churchill said. This is the beginning of the beginning of transitional justice. And it will evolve and change. And, and you will approach it in, in different ways. And there may be things that get shelved or get put aside or, or don't get done properly now that you'll return to in five years or ten years when you're ready or when you see the needs differently than you do in the, in the freshness of this uh, very immediate post-revolutionary uh, environment. And then the third uh, context, which I think was also very influential in those early days uh, of transitional justice, was the experience in South Africa. And South Africa, of course, went through a transition that was in a way negotiated very clearly and quite visibly between two men who ultimately both won, won the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts, the clerk and Mandela. Essentially, they made a kind of a pact that they would forego prosecution for the past, but not efforts at trying to clarify the truth and the memory of the past, but that they would forego under certain circumstances criminal prosecution uh, in return for an agreement to a peaceful transition to a pluralist democracy. And that was, of course, that paved the way for the election of Nelson Mandela in uh, 1994. And uh, Mandela was faithful to that commitment, and the South African government uh, did that, and addressed the issues of the past by, um, th through, most famously, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, I want to say a little more about Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. I, I know that that's on the agenda here. It's something that's being considered. It's something that I have personal experience with because uh, in the aftermath of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, there were others that were established. There had been some before South Africa as well. And the South Africans borrowed a lot from a Truth Commission in Chile. Which 
Chile had had its, its truth commission in about 1990, and by the way, it had a second one many years later. That's when I say you, you'll still be doing this in 25 years. Uh, it's an example of a country that had a truth commission, got the truth, but later realized that maybe they hadn't got the whole truth and they needed to revisit it and go back and do it. So that's one of the things that happens in transitional justice as well. My experience with it was with, in Sierra Leone, another African country where there was a, a, a terrible civil war. So not like South Africa where there was a racist apartheid regime, but a country where there'd been a, a civil war and where there were atrocities committed on all sides by all of the combatants. And then there was a negotiated peace agreement. And the only way they could get to peace in the peace agreement was to promise the warring parties that they wouldn't be prosecuted. So there was a full amnesty given in the peace agreement. But, and some said this was just to sugarcoat the amnesty. Uh, I think there were people who were cynical about the amnesty and thought it was just a way to calm people down. And others who saw it as a genuine <coughs> alternative to criminal prosecution. A Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established. And I was one of the commissioners. There were seven commissioners in the Truth Commission. Four of them were Sierra Leonean, and then three were uh, appointed on the recommendation of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And so that's where, where I came in. I was one of the people that was proposed. And I spent two years working there in Sierra Leone uh, from 2002 to 2004, developing the report. People often ask me, as they do with all of these transitional justice, uh, experiences. Did it work? Did it work? Um, you know, is my glass half full? Is my glass half empty? That's usually what the conversation was about. It's, first of all, it's difficult to know whether successful transitions are a result of the transitional justice efforts at all, or whether they would have happened anyway, even if you'd done nothing. Just as it's difficult to know that when there appear to be problems and obstacles uh, years later, that they are a result of the inability or the failure of the mechanisms, including the Truth uh, and Reconciliation Commission, to do its job. I think it's good to bear in mind this famous saying by the former Chinese Premier, Zhou Enlai. Uh, Zhou Enlai apparently, he met Charles de Gaulle at some point at some international conference, and they had a conversation, and Charles de Gaulle asked <laughs> Joe and Lai, did he think the French Revolution was a success? And Joe and Lai replied, in about 1965, it's too early to tell. <laughs> so this is the problem with transitional justice, is, is also with assessing it. But we can see many examples of countries. Sierra Leone is one of them. South Africa is another, where at the very least they're at peace, where there have been accomplishments, and where the transitional justice mechanisms, first of all, have not done any harm, which is one thing. You want to make sure you don't do any harm doing it. And in many cases, there's very visible forward progress in, 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 in many of these countries. So it's certainly important it's an important thing to do. It's something that probably societies always did to some extent. But we can go back, we can look in the last century at the end of the two great world wars. There were trials. That's a form of transitional justice, having trials. Uh, transitional justice doesn't replace trials. The Deputy Prime Minister said this earlier. It's not a substitute for trials, but it is um, a complement to trials. And it's also a recognition that sometimes you can't do trials for everybody. There are reasons why you can't, often very legitimate ones. Uh, sometimes, of course, you can't get the people. You can't catch them. Nobody put Hitler on trial. They couldn't catch him. He was dead already. It was too late. And yet you needed some justice to deal with it. Sometimes there are political problems, and this is a very difficult part of the equation. I've referred to other, uh, other contexts and other examples where there were compromises made in exchange for the former regime giving up power. Sometimes that's quite explicit, as it was in South Africa. 
sometimes I think it's more implicit, more implied, um, that when the, those who were in power and who were responsible for the abuses understand that maybe they can survive and they're not going to go and spend the rest of their lives in jail um, or in poverty or in disgrace, that they take a step back and they don't interfere with things moving forward. So this varies, of course. It's going to vary from, from country to country. Um, but sometimes the criminal justice route is not just simply not viable. Now I understand, I'm, I'm careful here to speak about the, the specific conflicts in Armenia, because I know a lot about Armenia 100 years ago. <laughs> but I couldn't speak here confidently to people who know it intimately and are deeply involved in the, in the political transformation of the country. So I, I want to be careful. I'm really just bringing some international experience to the, to the debate. But one of the problems, of course, uh, that has been mentioned is uh, corruption and terrible corruption. And uh, the corruption is ultimately a polite name for theft. Someone said at lunch the million dollar question, and I said, I think more than a million is involved in this, uh, in this, uh, in this million dollar question. And I guess you'd like to get the money back, or as much of it as you can. Lots of countries have experience with that, even countries that aren't really in a transition and where they just say to the, to the uh, corrupt criminals, uh, corruption even, you know, it's, it's not unknown. We had a case in the newspaper, the New York Times, earlier this week of heads of state to have been involved in tax fraud. I won't make, mention any names here, to be polite. But where, where, where tax fraud, many countries deal with this, and sometimes they say, you know, it's going to be complicated to prosecute you. Give back the money, and we'll give you a break. And then they negotiate how much they'll give back. I mean, I see that as part of it, but of course, that is making a compromise with justice. It's not saying we're going to punish without compromise uh, everybody who was responsible for the crimes. So I, I see that as something, again, of, uh, obviously I'm not telling you anything you don't know and that you haven't already considered. You're fortunate here in that, with, with perhaps a few exceptions, you don't have to deal with the, the, the most difficult parts that we encounter in, in countries. In Sierra Leone, I would see people who'd had their arms and legs chopped off during the conflict. They would come to the Truth Commission and testify, and they'd say, the person who chopped off my arms and legs got an amnesty. And that's hard to deal with. That's very hard, because victims are entitled to, to justice. And victims of that type of crime are often, they don't really care too much when you say to them, yeah, but we had to make a compromise for the peace in the future. And they say, I don't care about the peace in the future. I need to see justice done for what happened to me. And in South Africa, that was a frequent conversation because the people who had been the direct victims had more difficulty understanding the need to make trade-offs in order to, to move forward. And I think you're fortunate here that you don't have to encounter, you don't have to deal with and confront with a problem of that scale. There is, of course, uh, uh, an, an episode in your history from uh, 2008. I think it's the 1st of March, is that the date? And so allow me now to just make a, uh, to, to speak a little bit about a concrete example here in, uh, in uh, Armenia, which has been uh, addressed in, in many countries, including uh, in the United Kingdom and Ireland. I lived for, in Ireland for many years. I was the director of the Irish Center for Human Rights in the period immediately following the peace agreement in 1998. I, I served there for about 10, 11 years, and I live now in, in London in the United Kingdom. And there's a famous treaty that was reached between uh, Britain and Ireland and, and, uh, that, that, that has brought about peace after 30 or 40 years of conflict in Northern Ireland. One of the things that had been, it was like a, an aching, it was like a, a, a rotten tooth and the tongue kept returning to the aching tooth in that conflict, which was a, a demonstration in 1971 where I think 14 or 15 people were killed. And uh, there was a, a pathetic, inadequate inquiry that was held immediately after that left nobody satisfied except those who had been perhaps responsible for the killing uh, who were given a clean bill of health. 
And so they returned to that uh, about 15 or 16 years ago. And it was very important to do that. They had a, a huge inquiry in many ways. I think the sheer cost of it probably is greater than all of the costs of all of the truth commissions in every other country in the world combined. A huge, huge uh, business to inquire into the truth of what happened. I think that would be a very interesting type of initiative here, and it might be an important part of a mandate given to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, to find out exactly what happened. It may not be possible at this stage to contemplate criminal prosecution. After all, if crimes were committed in 2008, you had criminal justice institutions, and you had criminal laws to deal with it. And the justice system didn't deal with it. And so maybe it's unrealistic to say now, well, we can fix all that. Let's start. Let's, let's, let's do it now. Maybe the justice system isn't ready. Maybe it will do it later. But to get to the truth of it is, a, is an extremely important, important part of this process. One other element that I think is, a, is an interesting problem and, and this was uh, mentioned by the Deputy Prime Minister, is the vetting issue. And I know my colleagues will say more about it. Vetting is a, is a complicated thing. As I mentioned, part of the, the, the political uh, compromise that's involved in being able to carry out this transition without too much hardship and hassle is finding ways to raise the comfort level of people who think that they may be on the line, they may be on the list. And so with the vetting, obviously, there must be thousands and thousands of people who are thinking, is that, am I going to confront that? I'll speak only about one part of that, and that's the justice system. It's a particularly difficult and sensitive issue with the justice system. Um, and that's because the judges need to be confident uh, that they have secure positions in order to do their job properly. And too uh, cavalier or too, uh, too uh, abrupt approach to dealing with judges who you may not be very happy with, the judges of the past who didn't do such a great job, who didn't manifest high levels of independence and impartiality, um, that if you're too uh, ruthless with them, that you may unnerve the people who take their place, who think this is what happens to judges who don't do what the government expects them to do. I don't know how to get that calculation right after. I remember, and I'll conclude with this, having a, a wonderful, once I had the opportunity to take a long, long taxi ride with Albie Sachs, who was one of the great iconic figures in, in South Africa. He was a law professor. He was himself uh, disfigured, injured in a terrorist bombing by the South African police when he was an anti-apartheid activist. And then he went on to be uh, a, judge, a judge on the new constitutional court of the post-transition South Africa. And we talked about the transition. He said, oh, I've been involved in that. And I said, so how did you deal with these rotten judges from the apartheid regime? He said, yeah, he said, I was, I was on the commission of the Afri African National Congress, where we had to discuss this. And he said, the young militants there said, let's just fire them all. We'll fire all the bad ones. We'll get rid of them. Most of them are bad. There were a few good ones. We'll keep the few good ones. We'll get rid of all the bad ones. And he said, he said, I said, asked them, I said, how are you going to be able to tell that? How are you going to sort that out? Who were the bad judges and the good judges? He says, that's, that's going to be pretty hard. And they said, okay, well, we'll just get the really bad ones. And he said, well, that's going to be a problem, too, finding identifying them, and he said, finally, we just figured they'll get old and they'll either die <laughs> or reach mandatory retirement. Well, I'm not prescribing that for Armenia, but I'm saying it's one of the problems that you, you do want to be looking ahead. Remember, you have to respect the rule of law, and you have to respect the rule of law in dealing with the people uh, who you would, you know, in the old days, you would deal with more abruptly because you wouldn't have the European Convention on Human Rights to think about. But it's more important than that. It's you want to be careful about sending a message to the new people in the system that they too will be, uh, uh, are, they're being watched and that this could happen to them too. And particularly when judges are concerned, 
You want them to know that they're untouchable, pretty much, as long as they behave uh, in an honest and non-corrupt manner. 